Hello again, my dear students, and welcome to a new chapter in our energy harvesting course. We have to consider to together very two famous sources of energy in our previous two chapters, considering light harvesting, with a special focus, of course, on a solar spectrum leading to what's called solar harvesters or solar cells. And then we go through thermal energy utilization by discussing thermoelectrical energy harvesters. Now it's time for discussing our third harvesters and our final harvester in this course. As in the remaining part of the module, we will going to focus on what we can call the energy harvesting interfacing circuits, more toward electronics. Our third harvester is what's called a piezoelectrical energy harvesters one of the top three most famous harvesters, including solar and thermal energy. So, as usual, we start our slides with discussing what is this effect? What is the piezoelectrical effect? A piezoelectrical effect, by definition, is the process of creating an electrical potential or a voltage due to what's called a mechanical strain, or maybe in more uh, familiar way, we can say due to pressure. But here, as we are not sufficient enough with a mechanical background, we need to understand what is a mechanical strain is. So a mechanical strain simply if the elongation occurs in a material due to some acting force. The strain is defined as delta L over L node, where delta L represents the elongation distance and L node represents the original or the initial distance. So when such a force act on a crystalline material with a, with a certain properties or a certain characteristics, this can generate what we know as an electrical charge, which lead to a voltage and a current. So what is this phenomenon? As usual, from our previous energy harvesting, energy harvesting or the the energy har har harvesting phenomenon are a bidirectional phenomenon. If you remember, for example, in light harvesters, we consider both cases where to harvest or to collect light, I mean to have a light as an input and electricity as an output, which is a typical light harvester, or the reverse process to emit light, which include laser, LEDs, and different light sources. Again, in thermoelectrical harvester, we consider the bidirectional process, considering what's called the Seebeck effect, which is a process of converting a different in temperature or delta T into an electrical potential, or what's called a Piler effect, which is actually the reverse process of using electrical potential to heat one terminal or to increase the ter this terminal temperature with respect to other cool terminals. Here in, in the piezoelectrical effect again, we have this bidirectional process. So in the direct effect, you are utilizing this mechanical strain, force or between quotation vibrations in order to create an electrical signal, as you can see, or you can make a reverse process of converting an electrical signal into some sort of vibrations or elongations. The most famous and commonly used example for that is what we are currently using in order to speak. A microphone and a speaker. A microphone is a piezoelectric transducer that converts the vibrations occurred in the medium, which is air in our case, and then converted into an electrical signal in the form of a voltage. That is 
later on amplified and processed. And reversely, a speaker is a device which converts an electrical signal into a vibrations, which then convert in a, into a sonic wave to be heard by human bodies. So this is a very typical example for that. So does any material perform this piezoelectrical effect? Of course, no. As we discussed in light harvesters and thermal electrical harvesters, such effects are associated with a certain or a unique properties in some materials. So for a piezoelectrical materials, these materials or the most famous materials is barium titanate, this AB access restructure, BATIO3, lead zironic titanate, Rochel salt and quartz. Maybe these are the most famous materials used nowadays to act as a piezoelectrical harvesters. So let's now come to the question what is the piezoelectrical phenomena? Or in other words, how this mechanical strain is converted into an electrical charge and a voltage and a current? So the process starts as follows. In the, in the first initial, the main principle of an optoelectrical transducer is that a force, when applied over a crystal, which is, for example, quartz, produce electrical charge on the electrical surface. So if you, remem if you remember the basic concept of electrical generation, where n times p is, is greater than n i squared, this process is associated of the addition of an extrinsic source of energy to the material. This extrinsic source of energy can be a light in a form of a quanta of photons, can be a thermal energy, and now it can be an external applied mechanical strain or what's called a force. So such an external extrinsic force will generate charge, which is, as we know from our semiconductor background, a series of electrons and hole pairs that is capable to create an electrical current and voltage. Even as you can expect, the rate of a change produced will be proportional to the rate of a change of the force applied as an input. So this is very fundamental concept that the produce of a charge is not only a function of the of the force, but is also it is also a function of the rate of a change of the force. And herein, the concept of the frequency will come up. Maybe in our final slides in this presentation, we will glue up the concept of the relation between the created voltage and the frequency. But it's very important to recognize that. It's not only the force, but also the rate of a change of the force. As you can see, most likely this generated voltage will be very small. That needs to be have an interfacing circuit at the backstage in order to be amplified. If you remember, I just mentioned that when you use a microphone, the output voltage from a microphone is very few micro watt, uh, micro volts. That's may or maybe the, the most maybe of domestic to be to consider it in a millivolt. So it should be somehow amplified then to be processed. And maybe in the next chapters, inshallah, we are going to consider the process of what we can call the interfacing circuits in the backstage of an energy harvester. Okay, let's do it again. So the voltage produced will be proportional to the magnitude of the applied force. Here we have two important information. That the charge is proportional to the rate of a change of the force. And the voltage is proportional to the magnitude of the force. We will discuss this using analytical mathematics later on. So let's now go to mathematics. A principal equation say that this generated charge is equals to d times f, 
where D is the density of a charge of the crystal line. Usually, if you remember our semiconductor classes, this is divine per unit volume in terms of centimeter to the power minus three or something like that. And F is the applied force in Newton. So, as you can see here, a charge depends on two parameters. The first parameter is the availability of the charge in the material, which is the charge density. And the second is your force or the external force to be applied on the material. Now, this force F is equals to A E over T the over it uh, A E delta T over T. Now we use delta T over T instead of uh, L, I think we use it here, yeah. Instead of L and delta L, so it is just something to express distance. However, we prefer to make it here in terms of a delta T, to, that T is a thickness and delta T is the elongation in the thickness. So as you can see, here E is defined as what's called the uh, Young's model. So A is the area of the crystalline mean meter square. T is the thickness of the crystalline in meter, and as I mentioned, delta T is the elongation due to the force, and E is the Young's modulus in Newton per meter square. So what is Young's modulus? Young's modulus is simply the stress over strain. As you can see, E equals stress over strain. A stress is force over area, and strain is delta T over T. That's lead to E equal FT over A delta T. Or in other words, you can make F equal AE delta T over T. And this is the definition for force. Of course, A is the area, which is simply then standard times width, as you can see. Okay, so on substituting by the equation, so simply what we, what we can do here is that is we can substitute this F with its equivalent value in terms of a youngest model. So you can know now see that Q equals DAE delta t over t or in another words you can say that the output voltage to be uh, obtained because of the electrical charge the output voltage is equal to q which is the, uh, the total uh, charge over q which is uh, sorry the q here is the total charge yes that's true over cp or the capacitance due to the piezoelectrical material. As we just mentioned, Q equals D times F. So this is Q. And capacitance, as you know from your physics maybe, or from electromagnetism or whatever, it's epsilon A over T, where epsilon equal epsilon node epsilon R times A, which is the area over T, which is the thickness. Using this equation, then we can have a direct relation connecting the electrical energy or the electrical voltage to be produced, which is E node, with P, which is the pressure. As you know, that F over A or the force over area is a pressure. So this is a direct relation linking the electrical field to be produced in that piezoelectrical material with the pressure to be applied as a force over area. In terms of the material thickness, which is T, and this factor, which we will call it G, where G represents the sensitivity of the crystal line. So G here plays the same role as when we consider, my dear students, the CB coefficient in the thermal energy. So if you remember from the previous chapter, we consider the CB coefficient as the output over the input, the voltage over the different in temperature of delta T. Similarly, you can consider here G as the electrical field to be generated, which is of course directly proportional to the voltage. So this is reflection to the electrical energy to be, to be generated over the pressure times the distance. Or in other words, if you got here E node over T, as you know, electrical field over distance is a voltage. So it's a voltage over pressure. So the higher the G, the higher the sensitivity of your material. Or in other words, the higher the G, the higher the electrical voltage you will get for the same applied pressure. So you can evaluate 
the performance of your piezoelectrical material by considering the G parameter, which is equals to, as you can see here, D, which is the density of charge in your material over epsilon node, which is, of course, the uh, permittivity, the air permittivity, times epsilon R, which is the relative permittivity of the material. These three parameters determine to what extent your material is capable to be a good piezoelectrical perverter. Okay. So, as I just mentioned in the beginning of the lecture, that the rate of a change of the force is a very important parameter concerning the output voltage. So, usually when you characterize your piezoelectrical material, we consider what's called the voltage frequency curve. As you can see in this curve, in the x-axis, we have the frequency, which simply represent the rate of the variation of your pressure. And in the y-axis, we have a voltage to be generated. And as you can see, herein we have a resonance frequency. This resonance frequency represents simply what we previously defined by the maximum point. So if you reach this resonance frequency for a material, at this frequency, you can grab the maximum voltage to be harvested from your piezoelectrical material. And this is a very important design parameter whenever you are going to consider a piezoelectrical energy harvester to work at a frequency where resonance occurs. As you know, or as you can understand from this lecture, piezoelectrical materials can be utilized in wide range of applications. For example, flow sensors, so that you can make, make use of this motion or a flow to convert it into electrical energy. Then you can measure the rate of flow using the piezoelectrical harvesters. Of course, taxile sensors, force sensors, pressure sensors, Humidity, capacitance, of course, is a very important because, as you know from the equation, capacitance play a very important role in calculating the electrical field. So whenever you change the capacitance, you change the electrical field. So it's a very good way to sense capacitance and many other applications of the body. Herein, I will going to show you one of my students. His name is Ahmed Khaled. He, he has designed a... Sorry for this. He has designed an energy harvester using a foot bat. So I will just try to make it. Um, sorry. So let me try to play it like that. I hope. Yeah. I think this is some problem with playing the, the video via Zoom. So I'm sorry for that. But uh, in all cases, I can uh, upload this video for you in our e-learning platform so you can see that how this footprint is uh, converted to be uh, an electrical voltage. I will upload the video for you so that you can uh, make it, you can demonstrate it because it is for some reason it is not compatible with Zoom to make a recording for a video or something like that maybe but I don't know what, where is the reason, but this is a foot, a foot bath. So by simply by walking, this walking process represent a rate of a change of a pressure or a force, you convert this into an electrical signal or into an energy. This is one of the application where you can make energy harvesting out of walking, or maybe whenever you are doing sport or something like that, you can harvest energy. Thank you very much for your concentration. And see you in the next, I would say, in the next half of the course. In the previous half, or in the, in the first half, we have, we have considered together energy harvesting sources. In the next half of the course, we will going to consider how we will utilize this, how we will maximize this, what is the electronics beyond this circuits or these harvesters. Thank you very much for your concentration and see you next lecture session.